Great. So I'll give a, a brief introduction. Well, I'm happy to welcome Carl Vanderbilt to give the MTA seminar today. I've uh, been working with Carl since 2011. It was about uh, March of 2011. Uh, Carl sent a blanket email to, to myself, uh, Keith Baker and Dave DeMille, asking if we'd like to participate in the next generation of the ADMX type experiment going to higher frequency. I waited for uh, both Dave and for Keith to say no, and then I said yes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Carl came out, and we had a brainstorming session with uh, Dave Tanner, and we came up with a design that eventually became a haystack detector. Shortly after that meeting, a fellow named Conrad Lehner came here to give a talk at the uh, uh, Quantum Institute. I don't think we called it that then, but uh, anyway, it was a precursor uh, seminar series to the actual institute. And he talked about these amplifiers he was building. And I said, that's what we need for haste. For our experiment was ADMX HF back then. I told Carl, I told Carl, we have to get this guy, Conrad Lehner, involved. And uh, Carl sweet talked him into joining the collaboration. And in some sense, the rest is history. And uh, as you know, Conrad Lehner will be soon our uh, colleague here at Yale. And uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll turn you. it over. Yeah, it was, uh, those were heady and exciting days. Um, in fact, normally when I give the seminar on Haystack, um, I normally show a picture of Steve's uh, blackboard, um, which has, uh, you know, which we went to his blackboard with a piece of chalk and we sketched out what the thing should look like, sort of a preconceptual engineering sketch. And um, Steve left it on his uh, on his blackboard for a full year, uh, and we all admired it. And I sure use it in talks. Well, um, at the end of the talk today, I'm going to talk about we're going to do an even uh, better, greater venture. Now we've just been funded, uh, or it seems like we're going to be funded to um, do a, a much larger axion search called Alpha on uh, to look for the post-inflation axions. Very exciting. Um, but the technology has gotten much better. This morning we went through it again, but instead of using a blackboard, we used a whiteboard. So you can see we took we adjusted the, the whiteboard the previous hour, beginning a our design uh, <clears throat> journey here as well. So um, because there's quite a few things I'd like to talk about, I'm going to give a little bit oh, um, short shrift to the usual introduction on dark matter because by now I think everybody knows about dark matter, and I would say most people believe in it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the axiom, but I think this is also a pretty familiar story to people. Um, if it isn't familiar to you, then I think Steve and Rain have not been doing their job, I think, talking to the department here. I'll talk ab about the microwave cavity experiment, which has been kind of the workhorse probing for the QCD axiom for uh, now uh, going back to the late 80s, uh, pioneering experiments at Rochester, um, Brookhaven Fermilab collaboration at Brookhaven and University of Florida. I mean, we, we kind of stand on the shoulders of giants. We developed a lot of the early conceptualization and technology of the experiment. And I'll talk about something that um, where I got kind of drawn into this business um, on how does one take this experiment from much higher frequencies. Uh, and there was this really interesting paper, many of you might have read by uh, Matthew Lawson, and it was actually uh, Frank Wilczek's Stockholm Theory Group uh, back in 2019, I think it was published, on the idea of using um, wire array metamaterials uh, to uh, kind of break the tyranny of uh, what's called the one over the frequency cube, the idea that, you know, if you want to go to higher frequencies, the cavities become much smaller, much, much smaller in volume. Question is that cuts down your conversion power. How do you make something which is simultaneously big but has an arbitrarily high frequency? These guys came up with a really clever idea. Um, uh, everyone read the papers and like, gosh, I wish I'd written that paper, but it hasn't got a snowball's chance of not working. And then Will Schreck picked up the phone, called me, and he said, We're just a bunch of theorists, you're experimentalists. We need somebody to jump in here and do prototyping and validation. So I just got sort of tidily pulled into this. And, and got very excited about it. This whole concept actually, I think, really does hold water. I'll talk about the Axion experiment and then conclude with uh, a, a short 
kind of teaser on, uh, uh, and once the axion is found, where, where, where what that. Okay, um, this again is, I think, old hat. Uh, lots and lots and lots of dynamical evidence, gravitational lensing, uh, has a microwave background, uh, sort of uh, the uh, um, sort of uh, the uh, primordial nucleus interests all point to uh, a large component, sort of six parts of the ball matter being in some exotic form, very likely a relic particle from the time of the Big Bang. I think you also probably know uh, the uh, uh, the origins of the of the axion, uh, which is this uh, term, uh, this uh, uh, in the strong CP. Uh, Lagrangian density, which is explicitly CP violating for any random phase of uh, this theta, which can go between zero and two pi. But awkwardly, um, the, uh, and in fact, picking any random number out of a hat, that number should give rise to a huge 10 to the minus 15 centimeter uh, neutron electric dipole moment. Uh, on the other hand, going back to the times of Norman Ramsey, early experiments, and then dramatically improved since then. We know that um, the EDM is suppressed to a very, very, very high order, uh, which indicates that there's probably some dynamical mechanism uh, for driving that uh, theta down to the number that it needs to be uh, exactly to, to suppress uh, CP violating effects. This was a puzzle for a while. And then two young physicists at uh, Slack at the time, Roberto Pecce, and Helen Weinberg came up with a very elegant way, still, I think, uh, we'll check would probably say the only way of a credible way of suppressing CP violating effects, which is to turn theta into a dynamical variable and then posit that there is a symmetry breaking scale at some early time in the universe, some high energy scale, unprescribed, by which theta takes on an unprescribed value um, continuously connected everywhere in space. Um, which has no physical meaning at that point. But of course, in QCD, when one gets down to the QCD scale, time scales of uh, perhaps 100 nanoseconds after the Big Bang, um, these uh, QCD instanton effects give rise to this infinite number of vacua and periodic vacua by which theta at any given value will roll down to its um, CP conserving phase. So rather nice, they were really made an important contribution to physics. But literally within weeks, uh, Weinberg and Wilczek wrote independent papers showing up in the same issue of early uh, 78 of Physical Review Letters, which said they've missed the boat. If what they say is true, there's a smoking gun. And the remnant oscillations of theta around the minimum uh, are going to be a physically manifest field. And they said, go forth, find it. And uh, then a series of experiments, accelerators, reactors, we push the symmetry breaking scale up and up and up um, to much, which implied much lower masses and coupling constants uh, to where we are today. Uh, so the axion remains uh, a, uh, a very good candidate, but we now know it's probably at some very high symmetry breaking scale, which means very low mass, very low coupling constant, uh, which is out of the reach of conventional experiments and requires uh, real cleverness uh, to find. So the axion is a very light cousin of the pi zero. It's a pseudoscalar. Uh, we describe its interactions as g sub a gamma gamma uh, here, uh, which is going to be a very small number. Well, the mass and the, the coupling constant go uh, like, oh, sorry, there's a minus one missing. It goes inverse to the symmetry breaking scale, which means the mass is proportional to the coupling constant. Um, the, uh, it, if axions constitute the halo dark matter of our, uh, of our, uh, our Milky Way galaxy, uh, they probably have, well, the same distribution in velocity, um, as we infer, uh, from, uh, ordinary objects, uh, uh sort of, uh, the, these dwarf galaxies and other, lots of jets and flying around in our galaxy of uh, a couple of hundred uh, kilometers a second. So it's basically uh, highly non-relativistic. Um, and if it's sufficiently light on the order of some 
microelectron volts or 10 microelectron volts, it would have a very long de Broglie wavelength and very long coherence length for very macroscopic. It would be something on the order of even up to uh, 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 the length of a football field. So this is what is called wavelength dark matter, very high occupation number, very, very large number of, of, uh, of uh, axions uh, per six-dimensional phase space volume in, uh, uh, in, in physical space and momentum space. Now, you could ask the obvious question. Well, we know that the pi zero decays you know, 10 to the minus 16 seconds back-to-back -back photons. Um, why can't we very simply take a radio telescope, peer anywhere, we're looking out to our own halo, which is all around us, um, and see and just say, aha, here is a, uh, a line that we cannot ascribe to a molecular, molecular line, and it has the appropriate pro proper width of about one part in a million. Uh, it turns out that doesn't work because the spontaneous lifetime of the axion, if you simply scale, it goes like the, the scales is the fifth power of the mass. If you go from 135 MeV down to 10 microEV, you go from 10 to the minus 16 seconds to 10 to the 55 years, which, as you know, is much longer than the life of the, 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 the whole, whole time right now. So that is not a good strategy for looking for the axon. Now, the right way to look at the, the axion uh, uh, and by the way, Pierre Sakivi, a very distinguished nuclear uh, particle theorist at the University of Florida, uh, got his PhD here at Yale back in the 70s uh, or so, uh, is based on the Pribilkoff effect. And, and Pierre's argument is the following. A magnet, uh, mag static magnetic field can be represented as a sea of virtual photons. And just as, can, as we know, the, how Henry Pribilkoff showed us how to make an extremely accurate measurement of the lifetime of the pi zero uh, without using uh, a clock. Uh, and, and that is the fact that uh, a pseudoscalar traveling in a magnetic field, it has the two photon coupling, but one of those photons can be uh, a virtual photon and it can roll into the axion state with the same uh, uh, energy uh, uh, as, as, the, as the photon. And conversely, an axion, passing through a magnetic field can also roll into the photon state carrying the full energy, mass plus kinetic energy of the axion. And that is the basic, the basis of this experiment. So this is the uh, uh, schema uh, that Pierre Sakibi published in this paper that's now been uh, cited literally thousands of times in 1983, a very famous physical review letter, where he says, uh, uh, give me uh, three like Archimedes, you know, give me a, a fulcrum and a lever and I will move the world. He said, basically, give me a strong superconducting magnet, a high Q cavity, and a state-of-the-art uh, uh, amplifier. And based on technology, even in the 1980s, it seemed credible that one could actually get very close to reaching the uh, QCD uh, uh, axion uh, uh, limit, um, which uh, is... Uh, uh, confined to this very narrow band of mass and coupling constant space. Um, and so the experiment is a, a very sophisticated radio receiver. It's really nothing more than a car radio on steroids. It's uh, uh, you cool everything down to near absolute zero. Um, that Conrad is the world's leader, who's going to be uh, coming back here, uh, is the world's leader in um, sort of quantum limited and sub quantum limited. Uh, receivers for dark matter experiments. In fact, I think Haystack has been a pioneer based on his, uh, the development and implementation uh, of the squeeze state receiver I'll talk briefly about. Uh, even five years ago, we've been running with that since then. And one is looking for a very narrow line uh, above the background, which is um, uh, very weak, even optimistically, it's going to be about 10 to the minus 24 watts. And the story gets worse because you don't know where the axion is. You have to tune this in very small steps. And uh, the Yale team here has been giants because they've been operating on this experiment here for a decade, you know, doing the day-to-day -day operations here, keeping this thing working, keeping it sensitive, and keeping this thing marching along uh, year in, year out, uh, looking for the axion over uh, uh, what's now becoming a significant frequency range. To give you a sense, of how small a signal that is. I remember years ago, 
talking with Larry Lasher, uh, who was the uh, sort of the project manager for Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 launched in 1972. They had, at the time of launch, two transmitters, eight watts each. Um, 30 years later, <clears throat> um, the Pioneer 10 uh, was twice the distance of Pluto. It had gone beyond the Earth's orbit and was going away forever. <clears throat> and uh, one had failed. The other uh, transmitter was operating only at about four watts. And the signal received at Earth was 10 to the minus 21 watts. And of course, you built it so you know a frequency to. So the last signal I think was received in this 70 meter dish in Spain, and then it went quiet. So we're looking for something whose frequency we don't know, and is three orders of magnitude weaker than that. That's kind of a sobering thought. Anyway, um, I would say um, that Haystack has been, I put a technology giant, because I thought that John P. Yu might be listening in today. He's giving a talk tomorrow. He runs a, an Axion experiment in Korea. But since he's not here, I'm going to say it. it's the technology leader. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and I say, you know, we, we really developed some, it's not a big experiment, but it is compared to ADMX. But it is a very, very capable experiment. It's been a lot of fun. We have, you know, this is an experiment. It's been a, a little bit like a, having a garage startup company. It's a high on adrenaline. You can try things. You can fail. You can try crazy ideas. Um, and the ones that, that win are, you know, it make the experiment immediately better without a lot of uh, DOE bureaucracy. Uh, so uh, we've had a lot of fun doing uh, this experiment. Uh, and uh, the, I would say, one of the, uh, so anyway, here's the microwave cavity on the gantry. Uh, here is a field-free uh, region uh, uh, where the amplifiers are, uh, the quantum amplifiers uh, uh, are. Uh, here's the Duluth refrigerator. We put the thing in these thermal shields, shroud in the thermal shield, and then drop the, uh, the whole thing down into the magnet here. Uh, and this is over in Wright Lab West. I think you probably all have passed through there and seen the experiment at one time or another. Uh, Berkeley's role is making, uh, developing new types of microwave cavities uh, for this thing. That um, at the time we pushed the experiment up a factor of ten. We were all alone in um, frequency or mass, so to speak. The frequency equals the mass, the conversion of uh, conversion. Um, now the pe more people are getting into this business. We're now going to push the thing up by another uh, large uh, 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 multiplicative factor uh, with uh, talking about these wire array nanomaterials. Um, just a word here. Uh, again, I think you've probably heard Conrad, uh, probably I'm sure he gave a talk recently, but you'll be hearing much from him uh, in the coming years. Um, the uh, name of the game is aggressive background reduction. There's only so far, you know. You can pay for larger, uh, more powerful magnets, um, <clears throat> and uh, 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 you can certainly improve the cavity in many ways. But the name of the game, really, ultimately, is the reduction. Here's the Planck component, the black body spectrum that you can cool down and uh, uh, eliminate, except for one half of a photon quantum limit, and then the intrinsic half photon limit of any linear amplifier. Now, the trick that was uh, Conrad uh, uh, developed and implemented for the first time ever in a dark matter experiment was the use of a squeezed vacuum state receiver. Um, and I think you've probably heard about this. And again, I think the Yale uh, team here deserve kudos for keeping this thing operating at, you know, uh, like a high performance race car is operating as well as it can be every day. So I can Sharon and the whole team here uh, every uh, two weeks at our conference, uh, our, our collaboration call, uh, are, are keeping this thing working uh, on, on its tiptoes. Um, uh, basically, the idea is the following, um, that the uh, dominant contribution to the noise, the one thing that is irreducible is the dark port noise, which anytime you put a uh, a port on a device in a cavity, uh, you always have uh, uh, noise which uh, comes into the cavity like that. Uh, the noise in the cavity, and then of course, off resonance, um, this thing, if it's not impedance match, will reflect off the cavity 
and then go back into uh, the amplifier. So it's a single port device, the same amplifier uh, introduces noise into the cavity and then out again uh, in an irreducible way. Noise, um, if you think of as a sine like and cosine like quadrature, those are non commuting operators. And therefore, there's going to be an irreducible blob of h over four, I think, in uh, phase space uh, there, obeying a quantum uncertainty. So you can't eliminate it. You can squeeze it in one quadrature, but then it pops out in the other. And if you look at the two cases where you simply deal with a single amplifier here and you do not squeeze the noise, what happens is that noise is actually injected into the cavity. Um, the, <clears throat> it stays in there for a certain coherence time associated with the Q of the cavity, during which time um, the axion, which you can treat as a classical field, you will get conversion of axions into protons, which will give little bumps of random phase, increasing the total signal, but uh, into uh, 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 for uh, two pi here. And then when you amplify it, um, you amplify along one quadrature here, just some parametric amplifiers are almost intrinsically squeezed. The alternative is that you can pre-prepare the noise that um, uh, unavoidably gets injected into the cavity uh, and uh, uh, squeeze it in one quadrature, but then amplify in the other quadrature. Here you can see the signal being represented by this green bumper around the red uh, uh, irreducible noise there. And then when one amplifies, you can see, just looking at the ratio of the uh, major axis in the two cases, that the signal to noise ratio improves for the squeeze case over the uh, uh, over the unsqueezed case, and they were able to get more than four dB of squeezing. The test set up at Boulder uh, worked exactly according to theoretical predictions. The twin made here for Haystack worked exactly as the one in Boulder, and it was a big success. And uh, this was the thesis of Kelly Bacchus here, graduated I think a couple of years ago. Um, let me not go into this a little bit more, but I think it's been a great success. And to date, I think we're still the only axion experiment that's actually used a quantum enhancement technique. And I think no other experiments really come within a large factor, even in this standard quantum limit. Only LIGO has done this for any fundamental experiment other than that with the, the optical. There's Dan Palkin and the, the test set up in Boulder. Um, Conrad's got other tricks up his sleeve which are promising even more uh, uh, a, uh, a aggressive uh, quantum accelerations. Uh, and this is something um, that you'll hear more about and will probably be deployed on a stack in about a year or so, where you actually will entangle two cavities. Uh, and then by a state exchange of the appropriate frequency, one can essentially put all of the noise into one quadrature and essentially all of the uh, uh, all of the signal into the other, leading to a uh, potentially uh, factor of 15. I think in practice, it will probably be closer to a factor of eight acceleration and scan rate. Okay, so where do we go? The open mass range for the axion can be between a nano EV and, uh, you know, uh, almost a, a milli EV. If you just simply did, you know, integrations in very small fractions uh, of the Lorentzian, the cavity Lorentzian bandpass, uh, spending uh, 15 minutes or an hour at each one, it would probably take a Hubble time to discover the axions. This is not a good strategy. So one, one should be open to doing, you know, taking inspired, inspired stabs at particularly favored regions. Two of them are, I think, particularly compelling. People say, well, where does symmetry breaking happen? People will say, well, the gut scale. I mean, that seems to be a place where the action is. So uh, a symmetry breaking scale of 10 to the 16th would give rise to an axion mass that would be down here in the, uh, the uh, uh, nano EV to uh, you know, 100 or so nano EV scale. And, and there are, uh, there's one experiment building up at Stanford called DM radio, dark matter radio, um, that is looking at this scale. It's a kind of a more for an offshoot of the Sakibi type experiment. Um, the other is a very interesting one called post-inflation axion. These two represent two different cosmologies. I'm not a cosmologist, but in the case of the post, uh, the, the uh, pre-inflation axion, you have uh, a, a the this uh, 
touch a quint symmetry breaking happen, every part in space, like kind of a mosaic, picks out its own value of theta continuously connected. Um, and then inflation happens. And what happens is that one tiny postage stamp that has a, essentially one value of theta gets stretched, you know, beyond the, you know, to, to, to uh, the, the Hubble radius. And so all of space has one particular value theta unknown. The other case uh, in the, the post-inflation axion is that you have inflation first, and then Pache Quinn symmetry breaking scale happens, and therefore you have a, a universe which is um, kind of a quilt work. It's kind of a polycrystalline theta. And the effective theta is somehow determined by a global average of these things. But a little more scientifically, um, <clears throat> This is a, uh, our colleague at Berkeley, Ben Softy, um, actually has done what are probably the world's best calculations of where he actually simulates the development of the axion field. If you just sort of take random values of theta, um, <clears throat> what happens of course, is if you allow theta to be continuously connected, you can go around like this during values of theta, but you can build in a situation where occasionally you will have a singularity where theta is not well defined, and this is this this uh, basically this topological defect, which forms a string, uh, is a region of very high axion mass. And as the universe inflates, this thing wiggles and straightens out and shakes off axion. This is the dominant form of axions rather than this rolling mechanism I talked about before, uh, in uh, in in basically uh, populating the universe with axions. And theorists over decades have argued what this implies for the axion mass cosmologically to make up omega dark matter of about 0.27. Let me actually uh, see if, the, if I can get these his films to work here. So what he has done is these heroic calculations on the world's fastest supercomputers to watch the evolution of these networks of topological strings. Um, they cross one another, they form loops, loops collapse, they radiate away. They do all kinds of things. Uh, he has come to the conclusion that if Petit Quinn symmetry breaking happened before, in, after inflation, that the number, the mass of the axion should be about 15 gigahertz. If the axion spectrum is kind of self-similar, um, as scale invariant, which most theorists I think would agree it should be, and in fact he seems to demonstrate that that is the case. Um, the error bar on that, even according to his old calculation, is about 10%, plus or minus 10%. Generously, the error bars were probably a factor of four. He's, this fall, will be completing new calculations, and he shared with us um, that the new calculations on the Perlmutter machine up at Lawrence Berkeley Lab are going to shrink these outer error bars down to about 10%. If what he is saying is true, finding the axiom will be like shooting fish in a barrel. And Yale is going to have the experiment that will do it. Anyway, theorists dispute, but the basic message is where we are now is fine, but we really need to be pushing up, always push up in frequency for the post-inflation axiom. Okay, here's the problem I mentioned before. Uh, and the, the this inspired paper that showed up in Fizz Robot a few years ago. Problem with microwave cavities, uh, they're, they're easy to build. You can make them high Q. People are either beginning to make them superconducting. It works in magnetic fields. But if you want to make a higher frequency cavity, the linear dimension goes down. You lose volume like one over the Q of that. What do you do? Oh, and there's another problem, <clears throat> um, which we have to address, um, the, which is the fact that as, as one goes up in frequency, the one mode that you want, the one that has the best overlap with the uniform magnetic field, the TM010 mode in the cylindrical cavity, uh, all of a sudden you get an increasing thicket of TE modes which hybridize and mix and cause uh, loss frequency range to the fact that once you get up to 10 gigahertz or more, uh, your ability to even find the TM010 mode is basically gone. So we have two big problems to confront, and I think we've cracked the problem enough that we can now do the experiment that we want to do. And here was the, um, the paper that Matt Lawson and others of, of uh, Wilczek Stockholm group uh, uh, wrote a few years ago that was just brilliant. 
The basic argument is the following. Um, for a microwave cavity, frequency is determined by boundary conditions, aka size. Bigger, lower, smaller, higher frequency. If you use a plasma, the plasma frequency is a bulk property, not a surface property. It doesn't depend where the wall is. It doesn't need to know where the wall is. You could make a resonator that was arbitrarily large and had an arbitrarily high frequency. Now, the question is, what kind of plasma? You can't use the tokamak, it's very noisy. Uh, what they went back to is they harkened back to a, a literature, a very interesting literature, on a really fascinating, one of the early, uh, I think, fascinating kind of uh, 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 systems that people began to study metamaterials with many years ago, Sir John Pendry and other quite famous people, Paul Lavelloff and so forth, of a uh, two-dimensional wire array of very thin wires. And um, for a square lattice, you can actually uh, analytically calculate what that frequency should be. And if you use something that uh, uh, <clears throat> took me back to my infancy, uh, which was in the early days, shortly after Sharpak and Sally invented the multi-wire proportional chamber when I was at MIT, I was put to work building some very early wire chambers. Do you have any collider physicists here or any nuclear physicists who build wire chambers? Oh, okay. I was I was part of the, the army of uh, students that used to do these and we lived in epoxy and G10 and things like that. But anyway, uh, wire chambers in high energy physics, you know, tracking chambers and detectors are typically made with this uh, gold on tungsten wire, best comes from Sweden, uh, and um, spaced by a few millimeters. Uh, and it turns out if you simply uh, put together uh, an array of these things, you can make wireframes stack them together. Um, the plasma frequency for a square rate turns out to be about 10 gigahertz. Now, at first you're saying, ooh, what, thin wires. And yeah, that's exactly the point. But, but they're a nice system to study. And then you can say, okay, if this is a fruitful way to go, is do we actually really need to work with these expensive wires that are difficult to handle and break easily? So we'll come back to it a little bit later on. Um, so this is when the phone call happened. I read the article and it said, gee, that's really clever. I, mean, I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. And then Will check picks up the phone and you don't say no to an old friend. He said, look, I need, I need somebody who will uh, work with us and uh, prototype these things and validate the idea. So I got one of my doctoral students working on it. And did, did a fantastic thesis and all of a sudden realized this, this, this was really uh, working much, much, much better than I would have ever dreamt. So what we did was, was to make an experiment where we created a series of little uh, wire chambers about this big, single planes, of aluminum frames uh, with kind of uh, synthetic plastic bridges on the end. And we strung these wires and made 40 of them, stacked them up. And then we began to play with them. We began to uh, look at the distance between the planes. We shifted digitated them and shifted them with one with respect to the other, and began to compare it with the semi-analytic theory, which had been now well-developed by Pavel Belov and his group in St. Petersburg. The results were absolutely astonishing. Anyway, you could ask the question, okay, uh, how would you go about determining whether, you know, the, what, how do you, would you determine with this system what the plasma frequency is? And what you do is, is you do, um, uh, uh, you calculate the transmission through a dialectic slab. It's perfectly fair on a qualifying exam to st send a student to the board if the dielectric constant is real. If it becomes lossy, then I think most faculty would say that would be unfair to subject. It becomes a much harder problem to calculate, but you can actually find this problem calculated of what happens when you propagate a plane wave through a dielectric slab that is frequency dependent and lossy. But it turns out that this is actually the tool of choice. This is what happens when I take the calculation and I freeze the uh, plasma frequency, i.e. the spacing, and I freeze uh, the uh, loss term and uh, just make the thing wider. And you can see that the edge here of this is basically, if, if I make the, this layer of, 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 of wire uh, chambers, uh, wire arrays here, um, the leading edge here encodes the plasma frequency. Those oscillations encode the width of it. 
And if I hold the other two constant and play with the loss term, you actually see that that shoulder would round off and you don't see the oscillations. If I change the spacing, change the plasma frequency, you see the whole pattern move to the right. So it turns out that is the, the right surgical tool to pull out, to extract all the, the wire, the, the, the plasma properties from these wire medium metamaterials. And it worked like a champ. There's my uh, uh, undergraduate, Nolan Howitt. Uh, and uh, there is a, we're actually setting up to do uh, right here, um, a, <laughs> Uh, an S21 measurement, transmission measurement, there's actually, you count 10, but there's actually another 10 interdigitated there. There's actually 20 planes there. There's the two microwave horns. There's a network oscillator uh, analyzer just off to the left. This is what they look like. Um, that's about uh, 20 centimeters on an edge. And those are 50 micron wires spaced uh, by uh, 5 millimeters, 5.88 millimeters. And we were astonished. This is where I think this was the, the epiphany for me, when we actually put in one, two, three, four, five, and uh, at, at fixed spacing and simply looked at the S21 and looked at the theory when you froze all the parameters like this, you realize immediately the system's behaving exactly as you predict, according to the, the, the semi-analytic theory of, of wire rate metamaterial. It was quite astonishing. If you put a black cloth in front of this thing uh, and, you, and you say, tell me how thick the array is, you put it in one, two, three, four, like, like this, uh, it, you, you actually are measuring, you, know, the, 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 you, you actually, by fitting each of those spectra, you actually measure the array to better than a millimeter. It's quite astonishing. The plasma frequency, when it gets sufficiently thick, even at uh, five or 10 frames, you're already in a well-developed uh, plasmonic uh, uh, behavior already. So it's already behaving as a plasma, even for five planes thick. It's already within you know, uh, a percent or two of the asymptotic frequency. When you make these things sufficiently thick, more than about 25 planes or so, it agrees at the 0.1% level. I was astonished by this. And most importantly, you could pull out the loss term as a function of the number of planes. Um, and you see that the uh, loss term here uh, is would give rise to a Q of about uh, 250 or so. You say, well, that's no great shakes. I couldn't do an axiom experiment with that. But of course, the whole gang, the uh, this whole consortium, this alpha R and D team we have, have been doing a lot of modeling work and said, well, of course you wouldn't use 50 micron wires, but I can change the radius and uh, of the wire and the spacing of the wires in a uh, coordinated way to keep the frequency the same. And you get the optimal Q when they tend to be not 50 micron wires, but they tend to be millimeter uh, scale uh, rods, metal rods. And there the Q would be on the order of 4,000. That if you cooled it to cryogenic temperatures, it would be uh, greater than 10,000. And you'd be in business that I, we could do a perfectly fine uh, axion haloscope uh, like that. So we then uh, asked the question, um, how does one tune this thing? Well, you can change the spacing. Turns out for a real axion telescope, that's not particularly practical to make the thing go like an accordion. You actually, because you want to use your all of the magnetic field all of the time. You don't want to waste volume here. But it is an interesting thing that it does agree so well with the, the semiotic theory. So we then said, OK, what happens if I take the alternate planes, gang them together, and then move them either parallel to one another or perpendicular to one another. Uh, and this was uh, quite astonishing to us. Uh, you can see here we are in 15 gigahertz range uh, where uh, we've uh, uh, one particular setup here. That is the agreement we have. It's kind of at the uh, yeah, sort of sub, sub 1% level agreement uh, there with uh, between the calculations and the uh, and, and the experimental data, absolutely. And um, the uh, dynamic range is perfectly usable. I think that a couple of gigahertz of, uh, of, uh, of uh, dynamic range uh, in order to tune these devices. So we, we've actually been quite encouraged to pursue this. The other problem I mentioned, uh, we'll come back to what a real resonator looks like shortly, um, is the following. At low frequencies, this is the cavity that's currently been used in the haystack. It's been our workforce since the very beginning. Um, it's a two-inch rod in a four-inch barrel like that. 
um, you have a finite number of mode crossings um, that um, at the kind of few percent level where you get these voided crossings, mode mixings, you have to ignore that, go back and fix it up later. When you go up to more sophisticated cavities in the six, seven gigahertz range, all of a sudden the forest becomes denser. When you start anticipating making cavities up in the uh, 10 gigahertz range, it becomes basically impossible. In fact, I call this the where's Waldo problem. So where's the, where's the TM010? And uh, actually the little dots here. Uh, it's kind of dual valued, different values of the rotation of the rods out from the center. Uh, you can get the same frequency with two different configurations there. Uh, but it becomes intractable. Here, um, I'll just show you. This is an example of mode mixing. This is just like upper division quantum mechanics two mode mixing, where you, re where you uh, re diagonalize the matrix. Um, you have a TE mode, which stays relatively flat, independent of how you tune the cavity, the TM mode, uh, which is changing kind of linearly. In here, you get a situation where when you look at the field profiles, these are measured field profiles inside the cavity, far away from the mode crossing, that's a TM010, this is a TE060. When they come together, all of a sudden they hybridize, they mix, you have no idea what's going on, you've, you've lost frequency coverage. Um, and then as you continue tuning through this mode, which uh, used to be TE is now continuously the TM. This one was the TM, now it becomes the TE mode. Just looks like Rydberg atoms as well. Anybody who's done Rydberg atoms microscopy did this whole half to them as well. So, what do you do? Um, and what you do is, uh, uh, again, something that was uh, actually invented by Eli Yavanovich at, at Berkeley. I didn't, I'd sort of forgotten he was there when I showed up on the faculty about a dozen years ago. Uh, but he was the old master of this. This goes back to the 1980s. It's made a huge impact in optical photonics. It's made a big impact in the accelerator physics world. Uh, it's, it's a photonic band gap structure. Uh, it's basically the same physics as before, but just a, a little bit of a different language. Um, the idea is there are times that you want to trap one symmetry mode, typically a TM uh, mode, in the case of a linear accelerator, you want a you know, uh, accelerator structure stacked up and, and braised together to uh, preserve the accelerating mode, but you really do want, you really want to kill transverse modes because every ever so sort of slight beam deviation will actually, like pushing a, a swing, uh, begin to build up these transverse modes, which get worse and worse. And every time the beam comes through, the beam gets deflected more. You pump more energy into the mode that you don't want, and the beam crashes into the wall. Um, it's also very useful for people who design gyrotrons and other power tubes, microwave power tubes. And uh, a, a graduate student I took in years ago, uh, who had been an undergraduate at MIT, who had worked extensively in this area, um, <clears throat> now in the faculty at Wellesley, uh, actually came in knowing a lot about photonic band gap structures and sort of led our research program there. The basic idea is the following. <clears throat> If I take a lattice of rods, it can be a square lattice, it can be a triangular lattice, with a spacing uh, B and radius A, and I calculate, this is just like solid state physics, if you know block theory, if, if you've all taken Patel or some similar course like that, and it's very familiar to you, you get a band structure, there'll be regions where you have band gaps. And you can calculate uh, as a function of the uh, uh, ratio of the radius to the spacing of the rods, uh, where are the TM modes uh, trapped uh, and uh, where uh, are they uh, the, the pass band region and, and the stop band region. And there, when you do the mapping, you do it with hundreds of calculations, or thousands of calculations, you find that um, the uh, kind of the the border, the boundary here is this what we call a Christmas tree diagram. And you can't miss for very large regions of, of ratio of spacing of the radius to spacing, you trap the TM0 zero, uh, zero and zero mode. So if I make a defect here, if I remove rods in this structure, make an infield, the TM mode will be trapped, it will not radiate. The beautiful thing is exactly the opposite is true for the TE modes. For the TE modes, you can't miss unless you're in this, these little regions right here, all the TE modes will propagate out. 
So I have exactly what I want. I have a way of leading away the TE modes while trapping the TM modes. We've done a lot of work in this uh, region. I don't want to go too much into it because I want to talk about alpha shortly. Uh, we've now made tunable structures um, that uh, for which the uh, the TM mode is uh, is trapped. The TE, the TE mode is radiated to a TE, all the TE modes are radiated away, and you preserve very high Q. Um, so what would a very high frequency resonator look like? And Andre here has been, and uh, some of my, his colleagues uh, 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 are uh, been working on this. I, I think if you look at what uh, this would uh, look like in the case of uh, alpha, you would have a, uh, a structure in here uh, by which you would rotate diodes of these little wires, but now they'd be on the order of a millimeter scale. And then a denser pack here, uh, whose cutoff frequency was uh, high enough that you would trap the TM, uh, the uh, TM010 modes from radiating away. So this is what a resonator would look like for a much, much higher frequency uh, situation. Our colleagues at Sweden have uh, in Stockholm have been looking at uh, doing their own r &D. And uh, you can see they're also working on uh, ways of tuning these structures as well. So let me come to alpha. <clears throat> um, it's um, once this idea took off, I think it's uh, admirable that it attracted a pretty large following of people who kind of stuck with it um, from a number of universities. I see the primary ones have been uh, Stockholm, uh, uh, there's a Berkeley. Comrade has been involved with us. Uh, Yale has been involved with us uh, 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 quite recently. Uh, Rania Paris uh, is, uh, is, a, is now at Cambridge, left Stockholm is now at Cambridge, and a number of other uh, places as well. And of course, Pavel Belov's group at, uh, at uh, Bitmo in St. Petersburg. And uh, we've been working at this diligently with a certain discipline, meeting every couple of weeks. There's, been a, there's a whole cadence of theory experiment meetings, uh, superconducting coatings meetings, and so forth. And um, Alex Miller led a paper that came out, I think a year or so ago, so it's actually now published um, this year, um, which is a kind of a white paper, high level white paper of what this experiment would look like. Um, so we've had the, uh, we've had this working group going, working with a, I think, a, uh, a kind of an admirable diligence um, and uh, we've had a couple of workshops. One was virtual during COVID. And we had another one um, at uh, Oak Ridge this past October. And that's uh, some of you will know Marcel de Marteau, the physics division leader there, who's passionately interested in, in, the, uh, 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 in, in this idea. I don't know, I'll tell you why. I think uh, we have some real people here as well. Uh, or Danielle, I'll be visiting later this week. And I, uh, Mike, Mike, you were there. Yeah. You're, you're in here somewhere. That's awesome. That's Frank. And Gregory, Juliana. The bunch of folks in here. Now, the reason it was interesting is that when we submitted the letter of intent, there was a solicitation by four, and this was an unusual thing. I've never seen the likes of it. Four kind of power hitters in the scientific philanthropy world, the Simons Foundation, the Sloan Foundation, Templeton, and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation uh, put out a solicitation, total of a $20 million pot for small experiments. Uh, and the reason Oak Ridge, we got into this, we put in a letter of intent, is that Marcel called up and he said, well, um, we just made a deal with the Germans. They're shutting down their neutron scattering center. We've got this 13 Tesla magnet, absolute behemoth of a magnet um, coming as part of a Deal by which we're trading for access to meat. And we said, this is great. You know, this is this is where we're going to do the experiment. Uh, so we wrote the letter of intent, didn't hear anything for a long time. Um, we kind of called them up. And they said, well, we were expecting 50 or 60 proposals. We got 260. So it's going to take some time. Be patient. And um, then we all of a sudden realized that as, as lawyers are wont to do, um, things have become very complicated. And uh, then all of a sudden, we got an uh, email one day saying, congratulations, you've been invited to submit a full proposal. They cut it down from 260 to 26. And now I'm sweating bullets because all of a sudden we had the rug pulled out from underneath us. We had this great story, and then, and then we have no magnet. So there's, there's ex machina, Steve calls up and says, well, you know, 20 feet from my lab, 
There's the 16 Tesla magnet, haven't been used, and Professor Sean Brett would uh, be pleased if we used it. So um, we wrote a full proposal. At this point, I thought the competition's going to get very hard. Right? It can't happen. You know, by then you distill all these great ideas down. You know, laser trapping, on you know, beyond standard model physics, we have a fairly good chance here. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then all of a sudden, on June 20th, we got an email uh, that said, "Congratulations, you've been selected for funding." Uh, now I'm really sweating. So <laughs> we have to do this project right now. Um, we have to, um, we're actually now being asked to dissect the budget into two parts because the two, two of the four uh, foundations will join, have agreed to jointly oversee ours, which is Simons and Templeton. So we're working on getting that budget resubmitted. As soon as it's resubmitted and there are no further discussions at the satisfactory level, we will actually have a project in five years to actually build it. So we're actually, uh, that was really quite uh, an adrenaline shot. So in the meantime, I'm here to work with uh, Andre to get a head start to do a lot of, you know, the envi you know, envisioning and preconceptual ideas about what this experiment will look like. But as I say, collaboration is a very, very excited about this. Initial technical milestone will be a, a haloscope with a resonator covering 10, covering 10 to 20 gigahertz. You know, Ben's inside word is that the latest calculations he's going to come out with, the central value will not change at all, but the error bars are going to come way in. And uh, this initial scientific milestone uh, will be uh, two gigahertz um, around the best estimated mass of VFSC sensitivity, which I think this magnet should be able to do for us. And uh, we'll just say, uh, will make a kind of a very modest, as you made a very modest technical milestone to twice the standard quantum limit. But of course, we know Conrad uh, is going to deliver his usual miracles and will do much better than that. And uh, we're also working on, uh, our group is going to be working with Danielle on uh, exploration of superconducting uh, cavities. Uh, the Stockholm group actually has opened up a Search. I think it's maybe the first ever in the world, or one of the first ever, where you have an explicit faculty position searching for somebody in axion physics. Lots of groups around the world, year in, year out, say we would like dark matter, but they always default to hiring somebody in the dark matter. Well, our time has come. Uh, this is very, I think, a prestigious, uh, this is a plum job. Anybody who has general skills in astral particle physics, um, uh, in, you know, uh, experimental cosmology cardiovasculars would be very credible. They're very interested in female candidates because they realize they have a gender balance problem. Um, now, I'm going to wrap up in the next four minutes. Um, <clears throat> what happens when we find the axion? Um, I stopped saying if we find the axion, and now bullish, taking a more bullish approach. We're going to find the axion. The question is, what's, what's the next step? Um, Josh Foster, and Ben Softy's or this group led a paper on what could be learned if you had two haloscopes working. With one haloscope, you see the velocity distribution, the energy distribution, um, but nothing more. Uh, it turns out that if you take two haloscopes, separate them by as a function of distance, you can measure the coherence length of the axion field, which, as I mentioned, is is microscopic, and what that means depends on the, the mass that we actually find the axion at. But what we're going to do is totally analogous to the global array we have uh, of doing radio astronomy. So you can now, you know, for many years, it's nothing new. You can take John Bank, Green Bank Telescope, you can take uh, Parks in South Africa, and now soon, you know, Meerkat and SKA. Um, and the whole world, now you do radio astronomy with a baseline, the, of the diameter of, you know, 12,000 kilometers. Um, so just as an example, a toy example, and I was very pleased to do this, they, they actually wrote the, the paper using Haystack as an example. They said, let's do an example for 25 micro V, because that's where our Haystack funds are operating. They said, suppose the lab is at 41 degrees north, 73 degrees west. New Haven, Connecticut. <laughs> and uh, then uh, suppose the thing is that we separate the two detectors by 20 meters in the north-south direction. And uh, what uh, the, he does at the beginning of his paper, he says, okay, here's the coherence length, basically one of the de Broglie wavelength. 
Here's the coherence time, which also depends on the, the net velocity, for example, the sun moving through the, the static halo here, about 270 kilometers a second. You can then form these two terms um, where X is the spatial distance between the detectors and then V is the mean velocity. Uh, and these are, he calls the cosine uh, and the, uh, the cosine-like and the sine-like terms of the interference terms. And then he calculates what are the interference terms look like if you combine the phase of these two detectors. And he shows curves here taken 10 minutes apart starting midnight on January the 1st, 2020. Here's the manifold of curves. You see there's a lot of them that bunch up here and then they begin to move. So each of those little curves is 10 minutes apart. Here's the cosine-like component of that interference term. Here's the sine-like component. The rest of the paper is then they put in a lot of realism of you know, doing uh, maximum likelihood estimates. They actually put in realistic noise. There's really quite impressive realism they put into this paper and then showing that you should be able to do astronomy if you have three or more detectors um, in, in the same way that the two detectors of LIGO do and point within one degree of where the solar, in, indeed where the, the sun is moving through the static halo of the, uh, of the galaxy, or if there are cold flows, you know, the Gaia, Sasa, and Jervi, uh, Sagittarius stream and so forth, of these cold flows of dark matter that are coming through because the Milky Way has, you know, is partially digested other galaxies that have fallen into it and it's kind of uh, begun to disassemble. So I consider one of my jobs in life is to give Karsten opportunities. So, uh, problem, not problems, opportunities. We will have three magnets by the end of this year. We have one operating downstairs. Yale University, to compensate for the damage done to one of the magnets for the power outage, is buying us a, a basically an identical one of this one. And we have another one, which is going to be the base, the output experiment. So what would an Axion Observatory at Yale look like? Uh, <clears throat> so here's our present experiment. Um, we might put the big magnet over there. Uh, we might put um, a uh, effectively a replica of the current haystack here, over here somewhere. Where we would put these things and how far apart would depend on what the mass of the axion is. But this would constitute an axion interferometer or indeed an axion observatory. Uh, for, and of course, uh, as we I was learning today, that concept for the physical science and engineering building kind of wraps around. I think I've got this somehow right, and this will be showing up hopefully in 2026. Uh, this building will go away. But um, this is going to be very interesting. This would really be something like a, an infrastructure uh, a little bit on, akin to, to LIGO. Anyway, summary remarks. This is exciting. Uh, you know, this is just like the heady days of 2011 when we, when we got together and started planning Haystack. Um, following the discovery of the axion, we're going to measure its the coherence length. We're going to measure the phase space structure of the axion, and we're going to open up the field of axion astronomy, and it's going to happen right here at Yale. So with that, thank you. So don't get rid of that time. So oh. keep the magnets. <laughs> now the insurance screening our damage magnet like a used car. They think that it has commercial value. And if we want to keep it, we're gonna to have to buy it back. Like we need if the car is total, we can buy it back from an insurance company. We might have to do that with our magnet. <laughs> anyway, it's a different world when you get into business and insurance and all that stuff. But uh, if you have time for questions, I don't think anybody wants this room. Um, this was very, very interesting. And I love the idea of an observatory. So we'll get working. <laughs> but uh, on the R&D side, you showed the R&D that was in Berkeley for yeah. the uh, nanomaterial cavities. And then you also showed the uh, Sweden yes. small one. Um, they had a different geometry. They had a square geometry. Yes. I noticed, what was the reason? Is it just for aligning it or uh, um uh, well it's a little bit like our interdigitated planes uh measurement it turns out the greatest dynamic range is when you bring pairs of wires you start from a square lattice and you make the wires touch um the person who's been leading them is a young russian fellow now studying in iceland rustam balafandia he's one of pavel's students um and he's the one coming up with new ideas for how these things should work I think even they would agree that a 
square structure is probably not right. And if you can do something which has some degree of rotational symmetry, and I have simpler designs than the one I showed, that might be better suited to a cylindrical geometry. But they've been doing some fantastic work, including 3D printing these resonators. You know, um, so it's, it's really quite impressive what they're doing. Um, we haven't exactly decided uh, if you need to now go from 20 gigahertz to 50 gigahertz and so forth, now you're going to be in the world where of um, using much finer, quote unquote, wires. You might end up going back to wires uh, and you will certainly want to make them superconducting. So it could be that that kind of one dimensional or um, tuning arrangement would be the natural thing there. So the R&D for this project is going to go on indefinitely because we can't be sure we're going to find it in the 10 to 20 gigahertz range, and we have to be prepared to go up, and that's what our sponsors expect of us. So. Yes, another R&D question. Sorry if you mentioned this already, but have there been tests with like the wires at cryogenic temperatures? No, um, thank you. Um, that's a good question. We are sort of blithely assume that we'll gain the same factor of Four or so in Q going from 300K to 4K. Um, the question is, how do you connect to those wires? Um, in the case where they are um, macroscopic rods, it's a little bit of a simpler problem, but you're absolutely right, that does need to be tested. We are going to have a first test of that at Danielle Speller's setup. Uh, we're going to do a little visit to do some preconceptual engineering because we're going to have a whole campaign of tests funded by the DOE of uh, high frequency resonators for axion experiments in the coming years. Um, but that's a good point. I am cautiously optimistic we will it will we'll get the cues that we want. Um, if the superconducting coatings work, then in fact they will, uh, depending on what we use, will we'll probably uh, you know get the cues we want uh, at uh, um, even at a few degrees Kelvin. But of course, we still have to contend with the black body. We, have, we still have to cool them, for sure. What would the materials used for the wires uh, of the tests that were done at Berkeley? Uh, those are standard uh, gold on tungsten um, wires uh, made by Luma Metal in uh, Sweden. And uh, Pretty costly stuff, but as far as I know, they are the purveyors of all such wires for all high energy physics experiments in the world. I don't think there's too many competitors for them. Uh, yeah. okay. um, as you increase the volume of one of the um, material experiments, does it get harder to extract the uh, axiom power? Excellent question. The answer is that's another of the research questions we're going to be addressing under this DOE instrumentation grant. It may be that a C, you will not be able to suck out all the power or critically couple it or overcouple it with a single small antenna. And you may need several antennas on the outside in the way of something like a phased array or so. But that is a research question. For lower frequencies, I think we will get away with a single antenna. If you now are driven up to something like 50 gigahertz, um, then we have an issue. Then we have a research question. Is there an upper limit to the frequency range of which the photonic band gap technique can help you with the T forest? Like, does that only work up to 12 or 20? No, or does it um, you can keep, um, you can, yeah, I need to pull it up. Um, if you say I need a, a band stop at this frequency, you can choose the, the, the ratio of A over B. So you, you and in fact, I'll actually show you, let's go back to it. Yeah, uh, it turns out this region right here, this is up here is that um, I think, uh, I forgot what this is. This was a, yeah, this resonator is with a tuning rod and it is already working up in the nine gigahertz range. And, and it's uh, here. So I think it's, it's, you've got a very, very, very large headroom before you run into a problem. At some point, you will, may run into a practical problem, but it's not going to be in an anytime soon. Um, so I was wondering if this is something that's easily scalable. So the 
frequency range is determined not by the size of the cavity or um, but rather by the geometry of how the wires relate to each other. Yeah. So I was wondering if you can uh, increase the frequency range or change the frequency range using the parts you already have by either adding new, um, like adding a couple more wire panels or just by changing the way that they move in relation to each other or something like that, or will you have to yes. scrap it and get a new setup? Um, that's an interesting question. And that's why we, I've got Andre and some of his colleagues at my place working on various designs. We're quite happy if, for example, let's take an example as 10 to 20, it doesn't need to be a single resonator. We're happy if we do it in two to three bytes because each of those bytes is probably going to be two years. And copper, oh, you just buy it from a master car and you pay, pay the machine shop and you make it up. So we're perfectly happy to rebuild if you're building something once every couple of years or so. The more important thing is to make sure that when you're running in a particular region, you've really optimized the figure of merit, which is the C squared, um, B squared Q, uh, that. So, um, yeah, you don't want to be profligate with it, but on the other hand, uh, copper we can buy. Um, the observatory idea that you mentioned, um, do I understand correctly that you have to maintain a certain distance for a given mass of axiom? No. Um, <clears throat> what, the thing is, you, you actually will. If you take just two of them and uh, combine them, if you look at the cosine term, um, you'll actually see as you move them apart, you will see the, um, uh, if you put them two next together, you actually get the power associated with some of the volumes. As you pull them apart, you will get, you will roll down, but I'm trying to think of this, I think one over square root of two uh, at asymptotic distances, but you, you still see partial coherence out to many times the coherence length. Um, and, um, but, and in fact, uh, you might say, why don't you always, why would the optimal distance, if you want to make an axion observatory, be more than the, the coherence length? In fact, the, the case they used, I think they found optimal is twice the coherence length. And that's also a trade-off of um, the, um, um, the baseline between the different detectors. The more detectors you have, the better, for obvious reasons, if you want to start detecting direction you know, of, of, of these axion flows. So the so the baseline is not predicated on observing. Yeah. So. If it, well, uh, it, it, it is loosely, and, and they they come into the paper that if DM radio finds the axion, then the baseline will be 500 kilometers, so it'll be continental in size. So you'll probably want, uh, uh, you know, a Lindley Winslow uh, LC detector, and then you want a Ken Irwin there between Boston and and uh, Palo Alto, you know. Uh, so, uh, but for things in the tens of gigahertz range, it can go from like five meters, depending where you are, between five meters and 50 meters. As a coherence like, but as I say, you'll still see partial coherence going out to very many coherence lines. Well, there's no more questions. Let's thank Carl again.